Welcome, folks, to The Uncommon Good with Bo Bonner and Dr. Bud Marr. Every week, diving deep into the truth of Catholic social teaching and restoring all things in Christ. The Uncommon Good, live from Iowa Catholic Radio's Mercy Live Up Studios. The Uncommon Good is on the air. I'm Bo Bonner. I'm Dr. Bud Marr. And we are coming to you live. Me, from the Central Standard Time Zone, Des Moines, Iowa, Iowa Catholic Radio's Mercy Live Up Studios, where I'm the director of the Zeta Institute for Foundations of Ethics and Leadership and director of mission and ministry at Mercy College of Health Sciences. And Bud is coming to you through the miracle of robots and Lord Google and whatnot in the Eastern Standard Time Zone, Pittsburgh, United States. Yep, coming to you from the National Institute of Newman Studies here in the heart of Pittsburgh, your resource for all things related to Blessed John Henry Newman. And if you need so, I think Bud could grab you a few French fries to sprinkle about liberally on whatever food you might need. Bud, how are you doing today? <laughs> doing okay. We are liberal with our French fries. Whenever anyone asks, like, are people in Pittsburgh nice? We just say, did you get a second helping of French fries on your salad? Because that's all you need to really know about, like, yeah. <laughs> the level of someone's niceness that's nice or not. Yeah. I agree with you. So, Bud, you know, we went from, like, perpetual winter to now... We just had the meteorologist throwing out, like, days of thunderstorms. I think the weather is just like, you know, this variation stuff is, is kind of hard, so I'm just going to just gonna press one button for a few days at a time. So <laughs> we have uh, severe weather maybe uh, knocking at the door. What about you guys? What, what's even severe weather in Pittsburgh? I don't know. It's, uh, it's actually been a really, really nice week, probably the nice couple days that I've had in Pittsburgh. Um, my... <laughs> My oldest daughter, Madeline, compares Pittsburgh to Seattle. It's just kind of, this this winter has been a lot of overcast skies uh-huh. and uh, quite a bit of rain, which, you know, I'm someone who looks for excuses to sit inside by the fireplace and read. So, so far, I'm not complaining. Yeah, I think for me, that's been sort of sports mostly <laughs> lately. So, like, the, John uh, Leonetti was making fun of me about uh, the Thunder earlier today. Uh, St. Louis Cardinals, man, we do really good for about eight innings. It's that ninth one. It's a little little problematic. <laughs> well, the ninth worked out for us last night, but that was that was the first time in a while. <laughs> <laughs> well, that just teaches you, like, that uh, all things are fleeting, and why are you getting your hopes up? That's all. Yep. That's what God's trying to say. Well, as always, talking about getting your hopes up and someone who will come through in the ninth inning, Cartridge World, bud. Has Cartridge World ever blown a save in your life? The answer... No. 801 73rd Street, Windsor Heights. If you need printing needs, it will not run out in the ninth inning like, let's say, someone named Tom Holland. Holland. Well, you're really running with that metaphor. But, yeah, you know, uh, printers and those sorts of things can be a nuisance in our life. So it's great to have someone you can go to that you can trust. And I know from our conversations with folks over there at Cartridge World, it's always friendly faces and a, and a lot of help for your needs. Same as always, underwritten by Mercy College of Health Science. We just got done last week, in fact, Friday, having our big graduation. Speaking of the ninth inning, just going to run with this metaphor. uh, It's always wonderful to have um, everyone there, so many faces that, you know, no matter how hard it is uh, to work. And these degrees, I always like to point out, they're hard work because you're going into a wonderful field where you're going to do great things for the community. Um, Just to see all that hard work pay off, all the happy faces, walking across uh, the... uh, uh, the stage, and you know, not only to receive a diploma, but one of the things I think is really cool is we get to do the blessings of the hands. Bishop Pates comes and and blesses the students' hands and sends them on their way uh, to go do consecrated work. It's a wonderful experience. Well, I was pretty impressed, Bo. It looked like Bishop Pates was standing at the ceremony. Oh yeah, I had heard that. You know, he was recouping from surgery, right? So. He's recouped. He doesn't even care. Like we were, we were worried about him, and we we're like, hey, you know, do you need anything? He's like, I'm fine. I've been doing a. Uh, confirmations. He's like, I can stand all day and bless things. I'm like, yeah. that's a real bishop. <laughs> Minnesotans are tough. You know, they're not messing around. That's right. <laughs> it's indoors. He's like, it's not snowing on me. Everything's yeah. fine. <laughs> um, so, uh, as always, like I said, Cartridge World, Mercy College of Health Science. We also want to welcome all of our listeners. Of course, we play through uh, Central Iowa, uh, through the um, Iowa Catholic Radio Radio Network, but then of course on Saturday we get picked up in Oklahoma, both in the Tulsa and Oklahoma City markets, over ten uh, different stations, and we want to say thank you all for listening. And uh, yeah, it's just been a, a great run. I realize how long we've we been doing this, but I'm bad at math. Oh, let's see. Um, you know, our first show was August of 
2016. So we're we're I think we're going on 18 months. Yeah. So it's uh it's it's been a wonderful ride, and we get to have wonderful guests uh, like the one coming up today, uh, Dr. Cheryl Overmeyer. We both know her well. This is another person who went to Duke and then converted to Catholicism. I'm telling you, we could have a whole conference on people about this. Uh, mm-hmm. But uh, Dr. Overmeyer, she's up in DePaul University, the Department of Catholic Studies, and she's associate professor of Catholic Studies. One of the most brilliant people that I know alive today. I'm going to talk about. Um, happiness, eudaimonia, blessedness. Uh, she writes quite a bit on this in the philosophical key, and uh, we're going to explore exactly the idea about uh, how it is that happiness is not just an individualistic thing, um, but how that actually, you know, what that is and what ramifications that has for the social order. Looking forward to the conversation today with Cheryl Overmeyer. So uh, if his sports can't make you happy, bud, which uh, I think we've yep. really been labeling that, hitting that hard, the question starts to be, what does the world provide when it comes to what we think will make us happy? Um, and, yeah, you know, I think that that starts to be a, a, a very pressing issue. We, we hear more and more, even though we're materially uh, better off than many generations have been, uh, yet we still have this, this aching, um, this yearning. We have people who are more depressed than ever, suicide rates up and all sorts of uh, vectors of our society. So happiness is not just a matter of sort of self-care or even individual maintenance. This starts to be a societal-wide issue. And so if you're interested in that today, this is the talk you want to stay around for. So stick around because just in a few minutes, we'll talk to Dr. Cheryl Overmeyer, like I said, uh, not only up at DePaul University, but long friends of uh, the show. And Bud and I stick around. We'll be back after this. Jeb, that was the weirdest sounding eagle I heard. That must have been a baby eagle before the real baby eagle. Baby eagle being poked. <laughs> <laughs> now we're gonna have to we're gonna have to find some use for that sound now. Uh, but speaking of sounds, bud, if people want to talk to us, they can't because we're not gonna answer the phone. But if they want to text us, next closest thing they can use the zip whip. That's right, the Zip Whip line, 515-223-1150, 515-223-1150. Just go ahead and text us, and whatever you put on the show, we will try to answer. The Zip Whip line. But have you noticed that it's actually faster? It's, it's coming faster. Is there a reason for that? Uh, they uh, re-recorded it. Uh, Jeb yeah. has his whip, and he just, you know, he, he had a lot of Mountain Dew. No, uh, yeah, we're just making it so it's even better. So Zip Whip line. Because now we can employ it even faster. So 515-223-1150. We'll be back after this. Hey, guys, our next Man Up event is coming up on Tuesday, May 8th at Our Lady's Immaculate Heart in Ankeny. Everything starts at 520 with the rosary. The theme, Don't Stop Believing, Keeping the Faith Through Focused. Our very special guests will include Deacon Tom Bradley, Father John Seda, Father Mark, Eddie Magruder, and with a panel of six students. Register online at iowacatholicradio.com and be entered into a drawing for two pairs of tickets to the Christ Our Life Conference. Partial support for Catholic Women Now comes from injury attorney Fred Haas. When Iowans have been injured through no fault of their own, in a car, truck, or motorcycle accident, harmed in a work-related injury, or suffered injury due to negligence of others, Fred Haas has been on their side to help recover from financial, physical, and emotional loss. Fred, double D, Haas, double A. Online at fredhaas.com. The Des Moines Law Offices of Fred Haas. While we have time, let us do good. Support for The Uncommon Good is provided by Cartridge World. Cartridge World is an industry leader delivering high-performance printing products that help you save time, money, and print great. Perfect for businesses, home offices, college students, or busy moms trying to find affordable printing supplies including ink, toner, paper, or printers. For business customers, pickup and delivery are available Products are guaranteed or full replacement. Cartridge World, your low-cost, environmentally friendly printing experts, 801 73rd Street in Windsor Heights, 515-564-7400 and online at cartridgeworld.com. Support for Dowling Catholic Sports is provided by Two Rivers Glass and Door, providing commercial glass and aluminum storefronts, 515-222-4860. Joe at tworiversglass.com. back with the Uncommon Good, Bo Bonner and Dr. Bud Marr. We have with us today on the show, brilliant thinker, wonderful friend, longtime friend, Dr. Cheryl Overmeyer, DePaul University at the Department of Catholic Studies, Associate Professor of Catholic Studies, Dr. Overmeyer. Cheryl, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. 
So Thank Cheryl, you for having me. Yeah, so speaking, you know, we have a lot to talk about, but I want to just point this out. Cheryl is uh, the godmother of uh, one of my sons who actually slept in for the first time in weeks. So thank you for your, your prayers or mystical influence or whatever it is. Thank you, Cheryl. Yes, I'll take credit for that. <laughs> so, Cheryl, uh, one of the things that we were going to talk about today, uh, happiness seems to be in the news uh, in quite a negative fashion. All sorts of people aren't happy. Uh, we have more... Uh, material comfort than it seems like we've had, you know, in any time in maybe human history, uh, but accompanied by great dissatisfaction, um, depression, suicide, longings. And so when it comes to happiness, we have uh, a lot of people who want to talk about it in shallow ways, but I think it makes sense to say at a societal level, there's a deep ne- uh, uh, need to be more forthright, uh, foundational, to examine what we mean by happiness. And um, I anoint you as the person who's going to take care of all of this for us, right? <laughs> um, I can point to some uh, deep sources of wisdom in the tradition. That's what I can do for us. All right. Well, let's start doing that today. When we think about happiness and, uh, you know, when you're teaching this, for instance, to your students up at DePaul, uh, maybe what are some things that you have to, what, what's some brush you have to clear away before we, we can get to the meat of what we're actually after talking about happiness? Yeah, sure, exactly. Yeah, um, to the point uh, that you were um, yeah, raising in terms of, yeah, we've got this paradox where it seems to be, you know, along with this uh, notion that the Western world is getting better and better and, you know, this narrative of progression and, you know, more and more material comforts and yet people are less and less happy. Um, there's There's actually this notion that, all the things that we're naturally inclined to seek happiness in, especially things like wealth and financial security or even pleasure, especially things like luxury travel or this foodie phenomenon, um, these things are fundamentally misguided um, because um, certain measures of wealth, certain measures of pleasure um, are good, but they're, they're things that we can mistake as happiness. Um, And so many ancient philosophers and, of course, um, early and medieval theologians took this up as an explicit source of um, concern, and so they would address this very early on in their writings about happiness to try to clear the way. They would say, look, um, most people think that happiness lies in wealth. Most people think that happiness lies in pleasure. Most people think that happiness lies in honor or fame or glory. And you got to understand that these are mistakes. Um, And so instead, you have to understand um, that these are goods that accompany the good life, but you need to understand that they are subordinate to the overall ultimate good. Um, And so the rest of their writing is really sort of building up what that overall ultimate good is, this meta account of um, something that really gives life meaning, really fills out life. Um, and for most of these writers, um, this is a really full and robust account of virtue. So when we think about happiness, uh, is, is how it's marketed to us, how we sort of hear it most days, uh, virtue probably doesn't come up too much. Um, you know, uh, <laughs> I, I don't know the last time that I've seen um, a five-minute spot talking about virtue as what's going to make you happy. Uh, and so people might say, well, why? Is this just something that, you know, people who read nerdy books come up with? Is this, you know, people who just don't have access to these things? Um, but when it comes down to it, I think uh, reading the same stuff that you're talking about, there's a reason that virtue doesn't usually get brought up as happiness, and it, it has to do with the ease of uh, some of these closer goods uh, compared to virtue, which actually takes uh, some discipline. Do you find when you're teaching this sort of distinction to students, um, what do you have to do to make them buy that sort of distinction? That The reason that we see a lot of things called happiness is because of, so to speak, maybe their proximity or ease compared to the things that will make you truly happy taking effort. Um. No, actually, I find that um, sometimes uh, the juxtaposition of Epicurus and Aristotle is an interesting one. Um, 
Epicurus is an ancient thinker who really wants to locate the source of happiness in pleasure, whereas Aristotle is one of these ancient thinkers who wants to locate the source of happiness in virtue. Um, and I find that um, a lot of students are initially attracted to Epicurus, but then when we get to Aristotle, uh, a lot of times they really shift their allegiances. And I'm surprised also because Aristotle is a harder thinker to read. Um, but my sense is that partly it's because they understand that they themselves have found happiness a bit elusive and that then accords with their own experience. Um, and also, if happiness is something that we want to be long-lasting, we want to be complete, we understand that it involves making a gift of oneself to others. Um, it takes a lot of hard work and discipline. Um, it is something that we can really do something to work toward, um, and we can really sort of take ownership in. Um, but at the same time, um, we understand that it's not some sort of easy, facile thing that's just going to come to us. Um, so I, I'm surprised that students, I find that they really tend to buy in. Um, but again, I think it's because they, they themselves deeply want happiness and um, are willing to work for it. Cheryl, at the start of the show, in the introduction, Bo kind of talked about the paradox uh, between living in one of the most materially affluent times in history and then seeing widespread unhappiness in different ways like addiction or suicide rates. Uh, do, you, do you think that um, we're kind of living in sort of a unique period of human history where are there parts of our culture that, that um, specifically kind of distract young people from the true source of happiness? Or is, are these like perennial questions that, you know, there's a real resonance between uh, what you're having the students read these ancient philosophers and what they're experiencing today. I mean, I, I'm, my sense is that students tend to think that they live in a unique period because of, you know, technological advance and, um, yeah, that society and culture is, is so progressed that the 21st century has to be a time unlike any other. Um, but because ethics really concerns human desire and um, human inclinations um, and the way in which we interact with others, I think that these concerns are really perennial. Mm -hmm. And I think the challenge is really um, wrought anew every generation and that these ancient and medieval thinkers are always relevant because their perennial concerns. Um, so you can go back and, and read, you know, Aristotle or Augustine or Aquinas and always find, um, you can always find tidbits of relevance because they're talking about what it is to be a human. Um, they're not talking about what it is to be a human in this particular time and place, especially they're talking about what it is to be a human and have these certain kinds of temptations. Well, I think to, to really sort of uh, make this point, um, when we look to the Gospels and we see that when Jesus is really giving his, uh, you know, I don't know, central teaching, I mean, it, it comes up in two Gospels and, and a lot of importance has been accorded to in the tradition, but you look at the Beatitudes. Um, the Beatitudes, I mean, that starts to be sort of a, a, a kind of maybe weird word for plenty of people in uh, English. And, you know, so maybe the connection between what the ancients were talking about, the word they used for happiness and what Beatitude means, Maybe that would be something to go into as well. But here you have Jesus saying some stuff that's counterintuitive, but to your point, they don't need to like have cell phone addiction to need to ask these questions about what will ultimately make you happy. Here's Jesus Christ. When God became man, he realized one of the things he needed to lay down succinctly and in front of a lot of people and reiterate is this question of, you think you'll be happy doing blank, but really you will be happy doing blank. So this is to your point, but what do you think about the Beatitudes being this sort of central paradigm uh, to, to, to spread this word in the church and for others? Yeah, yeah. We, we talk a bit in, um, in 
talking about happiness, about some etymological distinctions, yeah, some term distinctions. So when you talk about happiness, a lot of times what we think about it immediately is just this, like, sense of, like, having a certain kind of feeling or um, a sort of subjective sense of um, well-being. But uh, what a lot of thinkers, even today in positive psychology, um, but a lot of classic thinkers really want us to shift to is when you are thinking of happiness to really start to think of um, sort of deeper sense of um, meaning. Um, And so some of the terms that they had used historically are things like uh, eudaimonia or beatitude. Um, And that's what we're really aiming for is is beatitude, um, and and this is what we mean when we call the saints um, blessed. And so when we talk about the beatitudes, um, this is meant to have a close connection to um, ultimate beatitude in heaven. Yeah, so the, the beatitudes are, uh, yeah, Jesus' um, way of really guiding um, guiding the disciples and all those who, who are there to hear through um, a natural progression and tutoring them in the way of happiness. So historically, it's been fascinating. Um, writers have um, studied the, the eight Beatitudes. These are verses 3 through 10. And, and they see a progression in these, starting with like verse 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And they talk about this in terms of having both a merit and a reward. Blessed are the poor in spirit is the merit. And then the reward would be for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So, and they interpret being poor in spirit as developing a contempt for external goods like honors and wealth. We've already talked about these. Mm. And then the reward there's becoming the kingdom of heaven is signaling that this is pointing your very natural desires on earth toward their supernatural end. And then as you move through the Beatitudes, blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. Um, Those who mourn can be interpreted as not being um, led by lust or learning to grieve over your sins. Um, starting to become detached from the pleasures of this world. Um, And then the reward of they shall be comforted is um, talking about how ultimately your natural sensuous desire will be fulfilled in ultimate happiness. Mm. And so there's a really sophisticated way in which the church fathers um, walk through these verses and talk about how it's meant to be a progression toward happiness and virtue and as you get toward the final Beatitudes, they really talk about um, the essence of eternal happiness itself. Um, and you can see this in the final verses, verses 8, 9, and 10. Um, and this is something that you can participate in here and now when you talk about, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they are children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And this is the idea that the kinds of behavior or um, the virtuous actions that you can undertake in this world are a participation in this ultimate happiness that will become fuller um, in heaven. Sure. I think this is a really great point because a lot of times people hear virtue and what they have in mind is following the rules or behaving, or maybe it's like a quality that's just sort of like... um, I don't know, unconnected to everything else. Like if if we say you're courageous, it's like we also mean like, oh, but you're tall and, uh, you know, or hefty in my case, maybe Uh, that it's just, you know, an adjective. But if we're if we're lining up virtue with a word like beatitude, you know, similar words with beatitude, if it's hard for people to really get at, you know, this is the same sort of root where beauty comes for right from. Right. And so I think it starts to be interesting when we tell people that the virtuous life is the life of beatitude. We're also saying that virtue is beautiful, right? And I think sometimes people would go, isn't beauty exactly the wrong type of word for moral behavior or even happiness? But I think that that's exactly maybe the uh, the way that we need to turn this on our head. To, what we're asking people is not only 
Do you want to be happy, like have a giddy feeling? We want to know, do you want to live a beautiful life? Do you actually want to have a life that, that, that you look at and that you inhabit that's beautiful? And, you know, sometimes I think that that's hard for people to do. You Walking through the Beatitudes, for instance, I haven't heard that for a long time. That itself is beautiful, right? How is it that we start out with the first Beatitudes and end with, with life with God? But I don't know. Do you, do you think that that... Is that maybe a surprising enough way to make people take a step back to talk about virtue as beautiful? Um, I think, I think that yeah, I think that's a helpful move, especially as a way into the moral life, um, and especially for those who are not particularly drawn into the you know sort of religious claptrap, um, <laughs> as a way to um, yeah really grab people's attention um, as, yeah, even a way to evangelize is to really present the beauty of the faith primarily first and foremost through your everyday actions. Um, If you can lead a beautiful life, which is a life of goodness and truth. um, Aquinas was a writer who held that these transcendentals are ones of unity. So he wrote about um, goodness, truth and beauty primarily um, as all being of the same and attributed to God. Um, and I think that this, you know, um, we're in a, in a time where we're really flooded with images. Mm. Um, and I think that many of the images that we're presented with are not ones that are very compelling. Um, and they have a very sort of superficial beauty to them. Um, and so I think if people um, people would be compelled to really embrace the deep beauty of the faith. Also, I mean, even the art and architecture of the faith itself is, has its own sort of command um, and can really have a grip on people's sensibilities. Um, I think that's a great way to evangelize. Not, not to open up a real complex discussion right before break, but I guess I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> I think you, I think you have a habit of doing this. Yeah, but. I know. <laughs> You've listened to some past episodes. It's like the 27 mark. Bud starts getting inspired. <laughs> well, maybe we can talk about it after the break. But I guess listening to that, it's great stuff. And I just, um, I can imagine someone who's like not practicing the faith or outside of the church or something, and they hear all this, and especially what Jesus had to say in the Beatitudes. You know, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the meek, blessed are the peacemakers. And they think to themselves, like, oh, that sounds grand and all, but those are the type of people in the world that get run over. And if you look at, again, like the images that we get through television and other media, the people who appear happy on the surface are those who almost live, like, contrary to those values. I'm, I guess I'm kind of, this is a layman's version of, like, Nietzsche's idea that Christianity is just slave morality. It, like, it elevates meekness and and ultimately weakness like as catholics how do we respond to that sort of counter argument you have a minute cheryl (laughs) you can you can start it and we'll we'll get yeah so like a a minute preview and then we'll get to it after the break yeah i mean there's often a student who who you'll get in class who says um well i mean we're not supposed to take this stuff literally right (laughs) i mean nobody takes this literally this is all a metaphor for something (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> a metaphor for um, what, but yes, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, and I think, um, yeah, I try to study, I try to use the saints of, as exemplars, um, and the saints really hold us to a kind of ideal that I think won't let us get away from taking this stuff ultimately very seriously, um, taking this stuff quite literally not as a metaphor. Right. And when we get back, we will literally talk about this more. <laughs> uh, but no, I, I I think that's great. Like the, the sort of person that's like, it's all a metaphor. And then you go, okay, metaphor for what? And they're like, you know, uh, don't cut in line. And you're like, really? <laughs> like that's, that's what Jesus was talking about? So uh, when we get back, we'll try to actually non-metaphorically talk about exactly this. We're talking with Dr. Cheryl Overmeyer. Bud and I will be back after this break. Stick around. <laughs> If you want to call up and say, hey, for instance, Jeb, we really liked the baby eagle. Maybe you should do that more. You can get in touch with us on social media. Facebook is Iowa Catholic Radio. Our Twitter handle, at IA Catholic Radio. Um, as always, the Zip Whip line, 
515-223-1150. And, uh, you know, you could probably even... Ma- Should we start putting our address in case someone out there wants to mail things, Jeb? Jeb looks very like he says no. I, okay, I guess not. Sorry, but I knew that you've been really wanting to like start your your long form letters back again. I for a moment I thought you were talking about like our personal addresses. Right, I'm a little worried. <laughs> no, yeah, Bud Mar, blah blah blah, <laughs> Pittsburgh. <laughs> I think you can just send it Bud Mar Pittsburgh, and they'll know, right? I mean, the... well, we had a good friend in grad school who uh, one day he was he worked at um um not Bath and Body Works. What's the furniture store? Bed Bath and Beyond. Something, and he, he was bored, and so he filled out all of these, like, interested customer surveys, and he put my address on them. <laughs> so for the next year, I was just getting these mailings from, from Bed Bath & Beyond. So maybe this is a way I can get him back. That's right. Well, and if you don't want to do that, sub that, Iowa Catholic Radio on Facebook, at IA Catholic Radio for Twitter. We'll be back after these messages. Programming support for Catholic Women Now is provided by Iowa's injury attorney, Fred Haas. For over 30 years, Fred Haas has helped injured Iowans recover financial, physical, and emotional losses from car, truck, and motorcycle accidents, work-related injuries, and injuries due to negligence. Most importantly, providing the professional, personal, and responsive legal counsel that everyone deserves. Fred, double D, Haas, double A, the Des Moines Law Offices of Fred Haas. While we have time, let us do good. Support for The Uncommon Good is provided by Cartridge World. Cartridge World is an industry leader delivering high-performance printing products that help you save time, money, and print great. Perfect for businesses, home offices, college students, or busy moms trying to find affordable printing supplies including ink, toner, paper, or printers. For business customers, pickup and delivery are available Products are guaranteed or full replacement. Cartridge World, your low-cost, environmentally friendly printing experts, 801 73rd Street in Windsor Heights, 515-564-7400, and online at cartridgeworld.com. Man up. Welcome back to the show, fellas. I know. like uh, it's, it's been a while. Mm-hmm. Um, I've heard your ratings suffered because of that. No. Significantly. <laughs> Every time we have a guest on that's not you guys, we get hate mail. Oh. Why is it not Bowen Mostly Bud? from our parents. But. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Who are kind of seen about 50% of our listening mm-hmm. audience mm-hmm. some days. All right. Do you know what time it is? It's time to man up with Joe Stopulis and Father Zach Kotsky, Monday mornings at 9. Arnold Realty is letting others see Jesus Christ at work through uplifting programs like Man Up here on Iowa Catholic Radio. This is Bo Bonner from The Uncommon Good. Bud and I want to thank Mercy College of Health Sciences for continuing to underwrite our show. The Catholic College of Downtown Des Moines, the programs they offer are a gateway into mercy, service, and a sustainable career. There are endless possibilities available online at mchs.edu. <laughs> Back with the Uncommon Good, Bo Bonner and Dr. Bud Marr. We are speaking with Dr. Cheryl Overmeyer of DePaul University, Department of Catholic Studies, Associate Professor of Catholic Studies. Cheryl, thanks for joining us back on the other side of the hour. My pleasure. So uh, Bud asked uh, one of his 30-minute questions with a minute left. (laughs) Uh, I think what it was talking about was something about everybody's scarred by students. We're like, there's always this one student. (laughs) Uh, But but I think to to reframe it, then I'll throw it back to Bud, there's – you can present this stuff, but there's always one student who's like, yada, 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 this is nice, but this is a metaphor. No one actually lives this way. Uh, So, Bud, how how, how do you want to restate the question to Cheryl? Yeah, Bo, I, actually in one of our classes, I think we got almost a, a precise version of that rebuttal. And the student was actually, I think he thought he was doing Jesus kind of a favor, like, yeah, that's nice and all. But it's like, <laughs> this is sort of an ideal, and you actually fulfill it by kind of, how do you put it? like um, Being polite? Well, yeah, well, you kind of track towards it, but you can never actually embody it. But Cheryl, I was really intrigued by your point that, you know, not so, like in the Catholic faith and the tradition, we can actually point to um, individual saints who precisely, like, took Jesus um, seriously, you know, as literally as possible, and and attained a sort of beatitude that we can point to as, like, this is what God intends for human beings to embody. Yeah, I mean, the saints are given to us as exemplars in happiness. The saints were all happy people. Um, but we're also meant to think of happiness in the way that saints were happy. Um, so that also gives you maybe the specific vision of happiness that Jesus has for us. Mm. Um, so you can think of, yeah, happiness in the way that um, Mother Teresa was happy. There yeah. you go. And I know you've, you've worked a lot with the um, 
um, the writings of St. Thomas Aquinas. And what ways did he, so he was building on the tradition of Aristotle, but what were some of the things that he kind of added to this discussion around happiness? Sure, yeah. Um, one of the things that I especially um, like and students really track with is uh, his treatment of friendship. So Aristotle has this really beautiful and compelling account of friendship in the Nicomachean Ethics toward the end. He talks about how there's fundamentally, you know, a few different kinds or types of friendship. There's a friendship of use, a friendship of pleasure, and a friendship of virtue. And he says, you know, we all go through the world. We have some people in our lives that are useful, and we have some people in our lives that we, you know, find pleasant. But our friendships of virtue, you know, those are the sort of real core friendships. Those are our real close friends. Those are the ones that guide us through the good life. They help and encourage us through our good times and our bad times. And we can't have many of them because it takes a really long time to cultivate and form these friendships, and we really need to share our lives with these friends. Um, so somewhere he says we can really only have about six of these people in our lives. I love that he came up um, with a number, by the way. Just, I'm sorry, that was one of my favorite he, he parts about numbers. it. numbers. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, go ahead. Uh, so, yeah, so he's got this notion of friendship of virtue. So Aquinas inherits this notion of friendship of virtue, and he says, okay, I'm going to take this notion of friendship of virtue. It seems a little exclusive, so I'm going to say, yes, um, you're meant, Christians are meant to have a friendship of virtue. Um, I'm going to call it charity. And I'm going to say that that friendship of virtue is with God. Mm. So Christians are meant to be friends with God. And in becoming friends with God, you are meant to become friends with all um, friendship of God and neighbor. So, yeah, Aquinas's notion of friendship is really radicalizing Aristotle's own notion of friendship of virtue, because rather than your six friends, you're friends with, I don't know, what is it now, six billion? I don't know what the population of the world is. But it's meant to really open us up to others in a, in a new way um, that we're not meant to be discriminatory in terms of, you know, who is my neighbor, um, we're meant to love others for their nature, which is created as good. See, this is wonderful because virtue, again, you know, we talk about the ways, you, we can have you on for another show and talk for an hour just about like the way the word virtue is abused. But one way I think is to see it very individualistic, right? Again, either it's like, it's just kind of like a quality, like height or maybe beauty or uh, left handedness, like some people are just virtuous in, in certain ways, or it's something that you kind of very personally cultivated, like he has those virtues and he has them alone. But Aristotle to, to Aquinas, this move really starts to make it much more social because, A, Aristotle says you're not going to have virtue unless you have friends who are virtuous and help you become virtuous. It's it's impossible to do it on your own. But then when Aquinas, uh, like you said, makes this much larger by like the importance of our friendship with God and through that our friendship with neighbor – uh, now the matter of becoming virtuous uh, is a societal concern. It's a it's it's literally important for the common good that you become more virtuous, and so this idea of happiness in the good life, living a beautiful virtuous life, stops being something that's just improving you. It starts being a necessity that society needs. Yeah, yeah. I mean, sometimes. People, yeah, this is sometimes a concern about virtue ethics is that it is concerning powers that are perfecting the person. Um, but, yeah, very much once you start to understand that justice is fundamentally a virtue that concerns others or charity is the virtue that regulates your relationship with God and others, um, you understand that virtues very much include yourself as, where, as well as everyone else. It's not just yourself, but um, but it includes very much yourself as engaged um, in the social world, or um, maybe we should use some of Paul's metaphors here, um, that you are a member of a body. Yeah, and this to me seems like one way where Christianity and Christian thought really plundered the Egyptians, so to speak, and took the best parts of what... Um, 
for lack of a better term, like what pagan philosophers had written about virtue and happiness. But how do the um, when we think about the actual spiritual journey of the Catholic faith? Like, how, how can we begin to think about um, the Church and sacraments as contributing to this growth in virtue? Sure, yeah. You know, once you start to become more attuned to the language of virtue, um, I find that my students start to experience the liturgy differently, which uh, I think is very beautiful. I mean, not only the liturgy of the Word, um, but also the liturgy of the Eucharist, um, they just start to see the language of the virtues just really sort of spill out and mark everything. Um, we also talk about uh, the Lord's Prayer um, as um, actually breaking down into um, each of the each of the elements of the the Our Father, the seven petitions. Um, go along with the virtues. So, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. It's meant to go along with faith. Thy kingdom come is an expression of hope. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven is love. Give us this day our daily bread, prudence. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. There's a sense of justice. Lead us not into temptation, it's meant to regulate our our um, passions, um, temperance, and deliver us from evil is fortitude. Um, so even just, you know, um, such a beautiful and short prayer that Jesus gave us encapsulates the virtues for us right there. Um, so, and also the, um, the sacraments themselves are um, really meant to be an initiation in our, our journey for happiness. So um, baptism is really seen as the beginning of that, that quest for eternal happiness, and uh, Eucharist itself is performing who it is that we want to become or who it is that we are, um, and yeah, also you could see reconciliation as participating in that. So you can really bring the whole of the um, the liturgical life um, and the sacraments into the scope of participating in this quest for true and ultimate happiness, um, participating in what it is that God wanted us to become, that he's created us to become. I, I just think this is, you know, it's brilliant. It's one of these things that tempt us to want to, um, you know, we want to we spread this word far and wide. Uh, and I think I've seen people, you know, with good intentions try to do this, that we go, you know, you... We know you want to be happy, but you're not going to be happy until you come here, until you're a part of the church. Part of the issue, I think, right, though, is that this really takes some radical education in terms of uh, we've either short, given short shrift to things like happiness, um, that it's something that we really have to dig deeper into. I guess another way to put this is, if I'm thinking about this far too much like a board game, sorry, Cheryl, I'm a board gamer, <laughs> um, you know... Christ has made these definitive moves, right? You want to be happy. The, this this speaks to very deep things in the human heart. Um, but the devil, uh, as it were, w you know, what he does is like he, he, he knows that he needs to take these terms and mutate them just enough where people think either A, oh, I don't need the church because I already am happy, or B, they think that the church is giving a similarly shallow definition of all these things. So I guess part of what I'm saying rambling on here is we, we have to, re, you know, we have to get back to talking in this sort of language, um, but we can't get frustrated because it's going to take a while to make people have these these deeper, thicker notions of happiness. Um, I, you, you know, you, you, you teach in a semester and I think you, you see, like you've said, a lot of work being done, but... Uh, I don't know any advice about how as a as a church or just even as like a, a person in the street that we can start that long journey of helping people think about the Christian journey as a journey towards happiness. Mm. I mean, I teach in a quarter, which is 10 weeks. So, yeah, it's even shorter than a semester. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's it's so it's so brief. Um yeah, I mean, yeah, I don't know. I was I was thinking that, you know, overall it's interesting because um uh the the history of moral theology was was hijacked for a while. 
Um, and it, it's only um, since the 1990s um, and early 2000s that um, everything's getting back on board um, with the encyclical Veritati Splendor by, uh, at the time, Pope John Paul II, um, trying to get moral theology back on board with this notion of happiness and virtues being this sort of central core of the Church's message. Um, so, I mean, um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I don't know. What do you guys think? I don't know how how it is to... Um, to recommend, I mean, I think the more that people, I think the more that people learn about the virtues, once they understand what they are, they're very easy to spot and see uh, everywhere. Um, and I mean, I do have a couple of very easy reading recommendations if people are interested. I mean, also the catechism. Um, the catechism is quite easy and encapsulates summaries of the virtues. Um, and once you understand exactly what they are, they're quite easy to identify. Or um, there's this really classic thinker called Joseph Pieper, P-I-E-P-E-R. Love that guy. Um, he's, he was one of the most popular Thomas philosophers of the 20th century, and he's written um, books on the four cardinal virtues and then also a book on faith, hope, and love. And those two volumes are just beautiful and super accessible, and students really like them. I think he has one, um, like, was it like a really thin one called, like, uh it's like the Christian understanding of man or something. And it gets, it kind of is a short brief one on the, oh, nice. the seven ones too. Yeah. So, yeah. He's such a great and, and um, very accessible writer. But I mean, the, the great thing about the virtues is you don't have to become an expert um, to, to understand what they are. I think as soon as you understand what principles, you know, are operating, then you can very much see them, um, see them in church life um, and see them operating in your own life and understand how to start cultivating them more. And then you can, you know, read saints biographies or whatever it is in your own personal piety and, and really cultivate them in that manner. Well, I want to, first of all, I want to actually stop the presses and point out something to Bud. I think this is the first time we've had a guest ask us a question. So this is, (laughs) I'm, I'm sweating here. I don't know. I, I feel like, I have to give the good answer to Cheryl or she's going to, like, give me a D. <laughs> no, um, actually, you know what I was thinking of, Cheryl? And, Bud, you can, like, uh, help me out with this one. Yeah. Uh, in the, your the show notes, you know, you pointed out the distinction that needs to be made about some of these words. And joy is one that we haven't got to. Um, I actually think joy is maybe one of the most hard-to-pin-down things for most people on their mind because they actually see so little of it in the world as it is today. They see people happy. Uh, they see people having a good old time. They might even see people who are generally optimistic. But that sort of deep sense of joy, what that means, and maybe even just like having people meditate on that, like what would it take to call someone actually full of joy in that sort of full way? I don't know, Bud, what do you think about that? Yeah, that would come up uh, when we would remember about talking about um, Mother Teresa and holding up her up as an exemplar. And uh, who was the, uh, I'm blanking on his name, the atheist, Christopher Hitchens, right? who said, like, oh, she's supposed to be this paradigm of happiness for, for, for Christ- Christians. Sorry there for that stutter. Yeah. Um, uh, and you actually would get into her journals and her letters, and for a long time she struggled with what looks like depression. Um and we would talk about with the students, like if you look at the pattern of the saints' lives, one thing you begin to see is that for many of them, they would go through this dark night of the soul. And it wouldn't be something that was seen as like taking away their joy or mitigating their joy, but it was actually like a step in the spiritual life that as you draw closer to God, even the consolations that normally come with prayer can be taken away. And so this is a sign actually that, you know, God loves you immensely, that you actually experience this kind of struggle. And so... We have to, I like this idea that, like, the life of virtue is something for everyone. It's not like an elitist effort. We do need these distinctions between, like, like we're not talking about superficial happiness, and you can point to the saints as both, like, finding happiness in a different source, but also not equating joy with necessarily just, like, good morning, you know, like, uh, skipping into work or whatever. So I know, Cheryl, is that good enough joy? What do you think about that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, Aquinas uh, classifies joy as one of the gifts of the Spirit. Um, so, yeah, it, it would make sense that that's more seldom seen. Um, yeah, joy, peace, and mercy are these, um, this kind of triumvirate. 
and and they're seen as um, accompanying the accompanying <laughs> the the perfection of charity. Um, so the perfection of charity is the, a sign of the deepest friendship that we can have with God. Mm. Well, I'm going to be uh, make a lame dad joke here. It was a joy speaking with you, Cheryl. <laughs> uh, and and then, then actually try to stretch it out to be a bit more serious. I actually think something like what we can show is Christians getting to talk like this and actually enjoying it and showing joy and talking about our faith is one of those, here's friends, don't you want friends like that, that really is something that might be how to, so to speak, evangelize these, this deeper sense of friendship. So Cheryl, of course, longtime friend for both Bud and I, thank you so much for coming on the show. It has been fantastic. Mm-hmm. Thank you. I just wish I could see you sooner. Thank yeah. you very much. Yeah, no, well, and then I should say that we're going to get Cheryl to come to Des Moines next year for the Faith and Healing Series speaker series. So, uh, yeah, we'll be having you there. And if you want to read Cheryl's book, we have it in the Mercy College Library. So, again, Cheryl, thank you very much. My pleasure. Well, Bud, um, I guess you know I, I, I got I. I'm going to reveal this on air. I've always considered you a virtue friend, not just a pleasure friend. So, good job. Oh, I appreciate that. There were two for me. There were two highlights from today's show. <laughs> One is when you were when we were going to that first break. Um, you were like, we're literally going to talk about this coming up. Yeah. I was thinking to myself, you're confusing all of our listeners because in, in the English language. Literally now means figuratively. figuratively. <laughs> or that's the way that young people, youngins use it. Jeb, why did your social group do that? Why did you change language, Jeb? <laughs> the second piece was Cheryl uh, asking us a question. That's awesome. And I, I'm just waiting for a future guest to turn the tables, and we're going to be exposed for just being frauds. Yeah, no, I, I'm actually what worried. What do you guys think? Yeah. <laughs> Because hers was like, oh, okay, that makes sense. Now I'm worried they're going to be all like, what about this quote on this page? You know, and he's, they're going to like find stuff that we all like, oh, yeah, we read Newman. Oh, yeah, we, we read Thomas Aquinas. And they're like, what about this? And we're like, uh, cut the break, Jeb. <laughs> Get with the, make with the eagle, Jeb. We got to go. <laughs> yeah, run that eagle. <laughs> Poke the little baby eagle. <laughs> Save us, baby eagle. <laughs> uh, okay, now people are like, I, I, I always hope someone tunes in. Not for the whole show, but just like when we're saying stuff like that. That would be amazing. There's there's some trucker passing through central (laughs) Iowa, and he he tunes in just for the baby eagle jokes. He's all like, I can't. And then he goes, I got to get more of this. And if you want more of this, every Wednesday in Iowa, every Saturday in Oklahoma, baby eagles, adult eagles, virtue, happiness, joy. This has been the Uncommon Good. May Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, reign in our hearts, in our families, in our city, state, nation, the entire world. For Bud Marr, I'm Bo Bonner. We will catch you all next week. But if they don't want to wait till next week, there's other things that they can do. They can sign up for the Intune bi-weekly e-newsletter sent every other Wednesday. So only two emails a month, not bombarding your inbox, complete with easy-to-navigate sources for station headlines, event registration, program highlights, and more. Uh, and then we have, of course, on social media, Iowa Catholic Radio for Facebook and at IA Catholic Radio for Twitter. If you're listening to Iowa Catholic Radio, what are the things that they can do to be involved every day of the week? We have um, various moments of prayer throughout the day. Uh, at 5 a.m., you can start off uh, reading the Bible through a year, so starting with Sacred Scripture to start your day. That leads right into the Rosary, the Angelus, a lot of great local programming. You know, Man Up with uh, Father Zach Kautsky and Joe Stopulis on Mondays at 9 a.m., and then Catholic Women Now on Thursdays with other in the heartland with Bishop Page, just Great stuff to stay plugged into Catholic life uh, there in Des Moines. Crosstalk. Did you mean not to talk about John Leonetti? Are you guys fighting? Are you not virtue friends anymore? <laughs> I'm keeping John Leonetti hidden from viewers. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the other thing, I, I actually, I usually have like a, a, a thing in front of me that tells me everything that's happening in the diocese. Yeah. Um, I don't have it on uh, in front of me, but like I said, uh, the bi-weekly newsletter, if you go on social media, I know there's stuff coming up in May. Uh, I think there's a Man Up event that uh, I just heard the commercial for earlier. So there's all sorts of things that you can do. But also, if you want to be part of our ministry, uh, we don't need just golden voices uh, singing like mockingbirds on air like Bud and I do. We don't need the brilliant, um, you know, IBM 1970s level intelligence of our board runners like Jeb and uh, Deacon Tony. 
even uh, the sort of Wells Fargo brilliance type of, uh, uh, wow. of, of, of office management that goes on at Iowa Catholic Radio. What we need more than anything is prayers from our viewers. And when you pray for us, you pray for this ministry. And if you feel so inclined, if you make donations, it allows this ministry, you to be a part of it and for it to extend 24-7 throughout um, Iowa Uh, goes through the walls, and like I said, it's even spreading to other states as well. So if you are so inclined, we would love for you to donate, but please donate your prayers. Yeah, we have the carathons uh, seasonally, I think spring and fall, but uh, we need that support throughout the year. So as, you know, Mother Angelica used to say, keep us between your, I think it was the cable and electric bill, two bills. Yeah. Uh, Do people have cable anymore? We might need to update it. (laughs) Your Netflix bill and your uh, yeah. Uber Eats bill or whatever. <laughs> Latte orders. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, yeah, always a pleasure, joy, happiness, and virtue to talk to you on the show, buddy. Well, it's fun to have Cheryl on. So how instrumental was she in your uh, coming into the Catholic Church? I'm sure you guys had some theological conversations yeah, she, back in the day. She kind of started the whole waterfall. She was one of the first people at Duke. Uh, yeah. to do that. So very instrumental. And uh, yeah, so I think I'm getting the evil eye from Jeb, which means that we're going too long. So for Bud, this is Bo. Uncommon Good. See you next week. God bless. God bless. The Uncommon Good with Bo Bonner and Dr. Bud Marr is heard every week on wonderful Catholic stations like this one and anytime on podcast. Just search for The Uncommon Good.